Welcome to Keeping Our Humanity Alive. We just heard Lucky, a song performed by Amin al Samai, who took Sweden by storm when she performed in the Swedish Idol. We will hear more from her, both as a singer and, of course, also as a refugee. We can conclude that the questions of peace, humanity and solidarity are from now on set to the highest test in the whole of the Western world. Russia has invaded Ukraine, and war equals refugees. True to the interreligious theme, we have one of EU's most distinguished Islamic leaders, Imam Yahya Palavinci, leader of the Islamic uh, religious community of Italy, and of course also the Archbishop of the Church of Sweden, Anche Jacqueline. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. We have had some sad events that has occurred over the few last days, and especially tonight when Russia invaded uh, uh, Ukraine. What are your first reactions? Oh, utmost concern. I think I was not the only one who shed tears this morning. Uh, it's a shock, although we knew about the risk. And this is a moment to pray and prepare for action. 
And unite. And unite. And unite. And Imam, if I ask you, uh, your initial reaction when you heard about the outbreak of war? Well, uh, as I think uh, every believer and every citizen, I felt very sad. Uh, I felt very sad. I was just, uh, I had just arrived here in Stockholm uh, under the so gracious uh, invitation of the Archbishop uh, Jacqueline. And, uh, and on one side, I discovered uh, Sweden that changed uh, uh, with health after the pandemic emergency. And at the same time, I had to witness in the early hours of this morning uh, this tragedy of war, violence, with no reason, no justification. And again, as you mentioned, uh, the disaster of people uh, without any place and, and peace. But uh, we, we will have to pray together and, and react in a constructive and wise way. In a situation like this, a lot of people feel fear and anxiety. What can religion bring to, to console them? I think a lot. Um, we have uh, trust in God that has been our refuge for centuries and centuries in very bad times and in good times. So we know about the strength of contemplation and prayer, but we know also that faith gives us the motivation to step up with humanitarian help and not least also assist refugees. Can you find courage from uh, religious belief when you go through this kind of hardships? We need to. We need to have courage. And you, you mentioned a very key word. Uh, it's, uh, it's a way of implementing courage uh, with hope. And as uh, Archbishop mentioned, uh, with uh, contemplation and reaction. Uh, but uh, I would insist on the courage of hope when everything seems to be completely lost. Uh, and also the wisdom of a reaction. It, ca it cannot be only an emotional reaction. We need some wisdom, and wisdom for us comes from revelation, comes from the inspiration of holy texts and of our prayers. Some people will be surprised, or maybe even dumbfounded, that you, who represent two of the largest world religions, Islam and Christianity, you cooperate uh, in order to, to build hope. What are your answer to them? Why not? <laughs> well, this is, should be the natural dimension of our brotherhood and sisterhood. Uh, uh, it, the, the question should be, if I may allow me, uh, exactly the opposite. Why not? Uh, when, when, when we do not share uh, with respect uh, a common engagement, we are mistaken. It's, it's very hope-giving to see you two together standing here and fighting for a common cause. But some people are uh, skeptical. And uh, what is your message to the people who will think that this is odd? Well, as a Christian, it's an expression of my faith to see cooperation with people of goodwill, all people of goodwill, for the common good of the world. For, after all, we believe that God so loved the world that, he, that God sent Jesus Christ to save the world. And we are actors in this. Uh, and also, as... Uh, uh, people from the Abra Abrahamic faith traditions as Jews, uh, Christians and Muslims, we have so much in common. We have trust in God, the creator. Uh, we have the love command in common. And we also have the language of prayer in common. Uh, what can we expect from this uh, broadcast today? Oh, we can expe expect a lot. We can expect reports from different initiatives uh, all building a world of neighbors, what we really need to emphasize today, uh, building a world of neighbors. We will have tes testimonies from practitioners and from refugees, and we will have music. When, when uh, you started as archbishop, uh, it was only about a year before we had this great surge of immigration uh, due to the war in Syria and yeah. problems in, in other places. What was your first reaction when we had this big influx of people coming? Well, I was touched. I was reminded of things. I was angered and I was inspired. I was touched by the um, vulnerability and the suffering, especially of women and children, uh, but also by the courage of those who were on the move and those who helped them, who assisted them. Uh, 
I was reminded also of the red thread in the Bible. Welcome the stranger. Care for those who Jesus calls the least of my brothers and sisters. Uh, and as a Lutheran, uh, working with refugees is in the DNA of the Lutheran World Federation. After all, it was founded uh, in Lund, in Sweden, in Europe in ruins, 1947, when we had so many refugees. And I was angered because it became a crisis only once a small part of all those people who were on the move reached Europe. It never was a crisis to us when all those, the majority of the refugees are internally displaced persons in their home countries or in neighboring countries that are host communities that are under much more severe strain than we ever were. And I was inspired. Yeah. I was inspired by the work of the practitioners. More than 80% of our congregations worked hands on. And that is something that I carry with me. That was a proof of strength. Yes. Now we're going to go back into time and we're going to see the whys, the whens and the hows that are described in this animated film. In the fall of 2015, over a million refugees arrive in Europe. Faith-based communities, alongside many others, immediately reach out to help. Other voices want to say stop and to build walls, and these voices weaken the support of humanitarian response in the continent. Archbishop Antje Jakilien identifies the need to strengthen the practitioners and communities welcoming and accompanying those who arrive. In 2018, a program is launched seeking out and connecting practitioners working with and for people on the move all over Europe. In 2020, a meeting in Malmö with participants from 15 countries agree on eight principles for an interreligious network, a world of neighbours. The network keeps growing as new connections are made. Today, a World of Neighbours network support each other and engage in collaborative actions for integration and social cohesion. Together, we are keeping our humanity today and tomorrow. Now we're joined by Anna Alboth, who is a practitioner working with the harsh realities that face refugees. She's a former Nobel Prize nominee, a journalist based in Berlin, and she's also a co-founder of Grupa Granitsa. Welcome, Anna. Hi, hello. You have uh, spent a lot of your time, energy and resource in helping refugees and displaced people. Uh, when it comes to the border between Poland and Belarus, you have been there and you've been doing some field work. But could we start with looking at the whys? Why are they stuck? And uh, what are they, their outlooks? Yes, of course. Uh, six months ago, the dictator of Belarus, Lukashenko, decided uh, to start organized action. He brought thousands of people from countries of Middle East and he threatened Europe. He decided to play with human lives uh, and push them on the Polish and Lithuanian border. There are mainly two counterparts here. It's the Belarus and it's Poland. And you uh, explained uh, the conflict for us right now. But which are the responsibilities that we, we the other nations and people in the, our nations, should put upon them? Well, we should try to force Belarus to stop doing what they are doing. But since Lukashenko is not a partner in discussion, I don't believe that it makes any sense to, to discuss with him. But what Poland should do uh, is to act accordingly to the law, to international law, European law, to Polish law, which means um, accepting the um, application for asylum of all the people who would like to do that. And the second, and in my opinion, the most important part is to stop brutal pushbacks on the border. There are people who were brutally pushed back already 25 or 30 times. What's so fantastic about you and your colleagues and all the other practitioners that work now is that although media doesn't focus that much on the refugees and their situation, you're still working at it. 
Why do you think that media hasn't had the focus on refugees and migrants lately? On the Polish-Belarusian border, it was very difficult for media to work. Um, Poland introduced a state of emergency along the whole border, so media didn't have access to it. Uh, what it means, it was very difficult for them to go to meet refugees. But it was also very difficult for us, the activists. Uh, entering the zone is illegal, but we all believe that if it's about human life, human health, minus 10 degrees at night and people with kids, people with kids with disabilities, we just, we just have to act. So this is what we were doing and we were also trying to be the source of information for media. Uh, it's a fantastic job, and what we're going to see now, it's a film from the border, uh, where you do a, it's a quite chilling film. Let's look at it. No, nie, los do strepy. zatrzymają i nas sprawdzą. Będzie wiadomo, gdzie jedziemy. No jeździmy w okolicy. Tak, tylko pytanie, czy podchodzimy wtedy do nich. Chodzi mi o to, że jeżeli będziemy mieli teraz trudności i będą nas zatrzymywać i tak dalej, to czy nie spalimy tej grupy przypadkiem? To była policja też. Tak? Nice to meet you. I'm Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Are you hungry? Water. 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 <laughs> We don't sleep three days. Ten oh. hours. To jest ewidentny miejsce dla odbioru. Tak. Bardzo niebezpieczny. Guys, hide, hide, because there's a lot of police. I know, I know. Yeah, so hide, because we are not taking you anywhere. We are, you know, activists. I think just for two minutes, this car, it's my car. Oh, I'm so sorry, you were hoping for us. No, no, thank you, my lady. No. Yes, we would love to help you. Guys, what, do you need anything right now? No, thank you. This is all, all. It's okay? Yes. Okay. Is there a lot of people here? Everywhere people. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. The car is coming. Some car is coming. Go, go yeah. and hide. Hide, hide. Really, hide. I'm serious. Hide, hide. Yes. Oh, hide. This go, is... go, 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 go. Hide, we can hide, be here, hide, you can be here. Thank you, thank you. Where are you from? Syria. From Syria? From where in Syria? No. no. Jak to wygląda? Większość ludzi, których spotykamy, to są ludzie, którzy 
nie wiedzą, w jakiej się znaleźli sytuacji. I, i oczywiście dostarczenie jedzenia i ubrania i wody. Nigdy w życiu nie widziałam ludzi, którzy w taki sposób by jedli albo pili, jeżeli przez 3-4 dni nie mieli nic w ustach. I to, to już to samo w sobie jest poruszające, nie? bo wydaje nam się, że żyjemy w takim świecie, gdzie choćby jeden posiłek dziennie jest standardem, nie jest tak. Potem jak sobie wyobrazimy spanie w temperaturze minusowej, nie wiem ile, ilu z nas by to przeżyło, ale dla mnie, dla mnie chyba najtrudniejsze teraz w tych dniach jest powiedzenie danej osobie, w jakiej jest sytuacji, wytłumaczenie w jej języku, na spokojnie siedząc, pijąc ciepłą herbatę, powiedzenie, że ma dwa wyjścia, albo się ukrywa w lesie jak zwierzę, chodząc po ciemku i może to być silny facet, a może być to kobieta z rocznym dzieckiem, albo jeżeli chce złożyć podanie o azyl w Polsce, naszym obowiązkiem jest zadzwonienie na Straż Graniczną. Natomiast zadzwonienie na Straż Graniczną z naszych ostatnich trzech tygodni monitoringu tego wszystkiego wynika, że w 90 albo nawet w 95 czy 6 procentach kończy się wywózką na drugą stronę z powrotem. Dla mnie to jest, dla mnie tutaj teraz w tej pracy, to jest najtrudniejsze spotkanie się z tą bezsilnością, której nigdy w życiu nie miałam, że jedyne co ja mogę to przyjeżdżać co noc do tego lasu i dawać komuś wodę. I, I jeszcze y, szeptać w tym lesie, żeby nikt nas nie zobaczył. To jest, to jest moja sobotnia noc. Tak świat nie powinien wyglądać. Dziękuję Wam za Waszą pracę bardzo. And of course, this film is shot in a longer version that you can find on the homepage of World of Neighbors. Anna, uh, has the situation for the people portrayed in this uh, film, has it changed? The situation changed only to the worse. So nothing changed to better. Uh, and people who are stuck in the forest are stuck not for three weeks, but for three months. Now it's a little bit warmer. Uh, it used to be very, very cold in December, but it doesn't mean that people are in better condition. Thank you. Uh, please stay with us because I think, want to integrate you in our discussion as it pro uh, goes further. And I will say welcome to two more practitioners that are representing the many hundreds of people working as practitioners. And first I'll uh, say hello to Marta Bolba who is a pastor of Evangelic Lutheran Church, Hungary, and leader of Mandak House in Budapest. The house accommodates newly arrived and socially deprived migrants and refugees. And we also have Amjid Gazir Kazir from the UK, founder of Media Culture, that has developed groundbreaking methods for how to combat racism and extremism. And he works with authorities, schools, sports clubs, nationally as well as internationally. And my first question to you is, of course, uh, uh, your thoughts about the war that has broken out in, in Ukraine. We'll start with you, Amjid. Desperately sad situation has been, as has been expressed so far today. Uh, we can expect another sad migrant and refugee crisis, but how do we pick that up? How do we respond? I think a lot of the work, if we're tackling xenophobia and racism, is about positive action. I think previous speakers spoke about hope and inspiration. But behind both of those concepts is belief. We have to believe we can do the right thing, regardless of the challenges that are coming. Uh, we can respond and respond positively and have that positive mindset to, to what's coming this way. Sad situation for everyone, but we have to be ready to respond as practitioners and as uh, organisations like A1. Yeah. We're going to look a little bit on the hows uh, as we progress, but what was your first reaction, Marta? As everybody else uh, in these cycles, we were really sad and also angry. And we were counting on that invasion and aggression. Uh, but uh, when it finally happened, and I contacted again my friends in Kiev. We are a border country to Ukraine. And, uh, and I contacted my friend. She was telling me on Messenger that she is headed to Kiev to take care uh, on my own her mother, who is actually dying now. And um, I think that it's really important to make uh, sure that everyone understands that people are dying there. In your country, Hungary, uh, the authorities in your country hasn't been that 
positive and been doing that great much work for people in refuge. Uh, do you think it will be different now when we can expect a new surge of migrants coming from a European country? Uh, I'm really hoping for it will be different and uh, we have to uh, get ready our refugee camps and the infrastructure. The mayor of Budapest, who is a social democrat called uh, Karácsony Gergely, he already uh, expressed himself that, that he makes uh, steps uh, towards making uh, a warm welcome to uh, to uh, refugees from the Ukraine and also several uh, non-governmental associations like Migration Aid and Menedek Egyesület and also the the Christian uh, associations helping migrants like Evangelical Diaconia. They they also I think that uh, prepare to uh, to welcome them. The Mandak House, uh, what do you uh, provide for the people who seek uh, help and refuge? Uh, actually, we we uh, organizing a social center and uh, there are different social services and uh, our uh, national church, like uh, the Lutheran Church of Hungary, uh, with uh, cooperation uh, with Germany, brought for the Welt, they they are offering uh, housing and uh, uh, different kind of donations to support refugees starting a new life in Hungary. You're known for uh, working with uh, how to bring people together and how to diminish uh, div 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 diversion between people. What methods do you work uh, work with? Our particular selected choice of medium uh, is film, but equally sport, art perhaps even music can be used to bring people together. Moreover, this is about providing an alternative narrative. When we have a migrant crisis and a refugee crisis, we have extremist elements in all countries looking to divide our communities and cause polarization by painting one group as the other, the alien or the threat. Education, as Nelson Mandela said, is the most powerful weapon in the world, but Education in a less formal sense, by using film and sport, bringing communities together, we create a safe space. When we have that space, safe space, we can tackle the myths, the misconceptions, and allow people to have a conversation and understand one another. We have all of the Abrahamic faiths and uh, even faiths from outside of that realm represented here today, people of no faith. But we all have an inert humanity that if we can express it and share our time, our our you know our social time together and learn about one another that's how we build resilience through those alternative narratives and then thus expunge any hateful attitudes and we can only try but you know we've got to be positive in this work yeah i would like to reach out to you anna and uh, uh, put the question we listen to amjid and he works with people that are already resident in uk uh, mainly what tools do you apply to to help the people in a more social context? Well, people already on the Polish-Ukrainian border, they are there, they are coming. There is more and more Polish people offering their rooms and houses. This is what each of us in, can do. Uh, I very much believe in this one-to-one -one connections. If you help one person in front of you who is in need, um, that's already a lot. And it's very scary to think about millions of people coming and our helplessness to help them. Let's let's focus on small steps. If each of us will focus, we will be fine. And uh, did you want to add something? So you, yeah. you? Again, we talk about culture and concepts of different communities. Culture and identity are very fluid things. And it's also to us to express. And if we have to respond to crisis and some emergencies, which are sadly happening all the time, we have to remain positive and uh, contemporary in our responses. So I couldn't agree more. One-to-one -one conversations, building communities stronger together. That's the only way that we can find a positive outlook for the future of human race. I'm going to put the last question to Anna. Uh, your fears and your hopes for the future, what are they? We all know that uh, fences and walls will not stop anybody. Like, we know it. Uh, what I like to say is that migration is like wind. There was always wind, there will be always wind. Sometimes it can be stronger, sometimes weaker, sometimes pleasant, sometimes very cold. 
but what a smart person does is to to learn from the situation. We wouldn't have sailing boats and windmills without wind, right? Uh, so I, I very much believe that we have to look into opportunities. Um, many of my refugee friends in Europe are experts in resistance, in uh, being creative. Let's let's learn from each other, not only one direction. Thank you. As we just learned, uh, our guests are bypassing differences and uh, in religion and in culture. Uh, and they're looking for practices where you can find common ground rather than diversion. The Church of Sweden has, together with an Islamic counterpart, established a working relationship built on respect for each other. It's called Goda Grannar, or in English, Friendly Neighbors. This magnificent church, built 1695, owes its name to the Swedish princess Katarina Karlsdotter Vasa. We call it Katarina Kyrkan, or Church of Catherine. Through the centuries, prominent burghers have been laid to rest here, and many generations of Stockholm's inhabitants have found consolation and refuge in the Christian faith, right here. Less than 150 meters from this church, the city of Stockholm appointed a location for the Zaid Ben Sultan Al Nayan Mosque. We are on our way to visit this beautiful house of worship that was inaugurated in the year of 2000 for the faith of Islam. The proximity between the different religious beliefs could have been charged. But on the contrary, the two faiths have chosen to look at what unites rather than divides them. Well, how that is done, we shall soon find out. Hey, Jalal. Trevligt att vara här på Café Medkänsla vid Moskén. Tack, tack. Vad är det ni gör här på, på det här kaféet? Ja, vi gör eh, mycket. Eh, vi har eh, samhället information, rådgivning, eh, hjälp med eh, mat och eh, många frågor när det gäller myndighetsfrågor, försäkringskassa, arbetsförmedlingen och eh, Migrationverket. Alla de här kategorierna vi kör på det. Och det här är ett samarbete som ni driver också som kallas för goda grannar. Ja, goda grannar. Det här började 2015 när det var flyktingvågen här i Sverige. Det spelar ingen roll. Muslim och kristna de kommer flyktingar hit och de duschar i moskéerna och byter kläder och de äter och sen de sover i kyrkan. Vi säger inte det här, vi kristna eller muslimer. Vi gör någonting i praktiken. När vi träffar folk, de flyktingar, de kommer från konfliktområdet, från Syrien och från Eritrea. Vi ger dem hopp att man kan leva tillsammans. Välkommen, men det är kanske jag som ska vara välkomnad för jag är här hos er på Medkänsla. Du är volontär ja. inom Goda grannar. Och du är teolog och har jobbat inom UD. Vad har det här arbetet som volontär, vad har det gett dig? Vad har du lärt dig av det? Det det ger mig, ska jag säga, det är en djupare förståelse för andra kulturer. Det ger mig också varje dag som jag är här en slags ödmjukhet för hur tillvaron verkligen ser ut för många människor. I grunden så har vi så mycket mer gemensamt, vi kristna och muslimer, än det som skiljer oss åt. Den uppfordran som finns i vårt, våra grundläggande värderingar, att hjälpa och stödja och ta hand om. Så för mig är det en väldigt bra värdegrund där vi har något gemensamt. Det är klart att det är mycket som skiljer oss åt, men om vi börjar med det som vi har gemensamt- så går det ganska lätt sen att komma vidare i de frågor där vi inte kanske har samsyn. Hej! Hej! Hur kom ni i kontakt med goda grannar? Träffa via Hisbrook Café. Gå på råta. Brata min min modersmål och arabiska bara dom. Och asfaniska på mig, ni. Jag förstår inte min namn, A eller C eller S eller S. Jag vet inte. Jag behöver lära mycket 
Och på tjocka mycket och behöver kompisar eller... Vad saknar du ifrån Sudan? Efter skolan jag kommer till hemma. Inte uh, har familjen i Sverige jag. Men också inte har kompisar i Sverige. Min bakgrund är ju att jag har jobbat som idrottslärare många, många år och älskar verkligen det här med idrott och hälsa och träning. Sen började jag jobba här i Svenska kyrkan och kom i kontakt med goda grannar. Och jag tänker alltså just, just att träningsformen är så otroligt, otroligt perfekt att kombinera med språkinlärning och med att träffa nya människor. Jag tror att man river massvis med barriärer. Det skapar också en gemenskap. Man tänker inte på att vi är olika. Vi är bara en stor grupp som har kul tillsammans. Vi går bak, kliver bak ett steg. Duttar knät om vi kan i golvet och skjuter upp. Hon lär inte tänka då. Nu är vi alla stjärn. Alla tog sig på. Vi känner rycka rycka. Kämp. Du är ju lite mitt emellan kille, lite som jag. Du är ju född i Sverige till och med. Det är inte jag, men jag har bott här ännu längre än du. Men det är bara för att jag är gammal. Men hur är det för dig om jag tänker så här? Du kan ju arabiska, så du har ju en, ett steg närmare kommunikationsmässigt. Vilken roll tycker du att goda grannar som helhet och det här med träningen kan spela och spelar? Arabiska, det hjälpte till idag som vi såg på träningen. Jag översatte lite till vissa personer. Som kanske inte förstod övningen helt och hållet. Då blir det enklare för dem kanske att komma in i gruppen. Och kanske skapa en liten gemenskap. Bygga nya relationer. Träna på språket. Sista frågan. Vad betyder träningen för dig? Oh, träna är jättebra. Man. Jag tycker om träna. Jag behöver varje dag. Eller varje uh, torsdag. För att träna innan bara jag vill. Ja, tack. Tack. Lycka till. Imam Yaya. What are the greatest challenges when it comes to integration of refugees and migrants? Well, uh, it's uh, ignorance and uh, mistrust based on, uh, on uh, no knowledge and arrogance. Because so in order to avoid to uh, um, study or know and discover the other, one uh, increases his selfishness and pretends to create reasons in order to close towards the other. It's uh, something that uh, needs a great uh, uh, educational response. And this is where also religious leaders and the example we just saw in Sweden by the Church of Sweden is very, very inspiring. Uh, the lack of integration or, or acceptance had a very high price for you and your family. Uh, you can take it in, in, in short, but it was a very steep price. It was indeed. Uh, we lost my uncle Zubair in 2011 post what was an alleged racist assault uh, as a Muslim, a taxi driver, the night preceding a march by a far-right group. He was tragically assaulted whilst driving his cab and he passed away in Ramadan. So we've paid a, a huge price personally as a family, but Again, we talk about finding inspiration and belief and hope. And just to add to what the Imam said, the politicization of identity, migrant crises and refugees, these are daily challenges. So whether it's a personal tragedy, a political motivation, or just for the sake of humanity, we can all do more. So whatever's happened, has happened. We move on, we press on, and we do more. Yeah. And you have done a great job out of this bad experience. In the Mandak House, and how you work, how do you work uh, with people who have different practices and religions? How do you make people uh, come together? We make dinner parties <laughs> and uh, make, uh, so the, the refugees and people from other backgrounds, they cook to each other and already for Hungarian people. So we sit together and cook together and eat together. And then we can talk, sing and, and make relationships. So, so we have fight this uh, alienation and selfishness to share what we have, uh, cultural and also the delicious foods, and, and we build up relationships.
this is something that is a little bit difficult for the authorities to provide. And, and if they provide it, it's, it's in a different context. Uh, what is your take? Because it's not only religions, religious uh, faith uh, incorporated, it's also NGOs. Or am I right? Yeah, are you asking what is the surplus of having yes. faith-based yeah. organizations? Yeah. Uh, well, I think it is um, uh, we bring to the table uh, centuries and centuries of experience and wisdom, uh, both based on uh, failure, but also on uh, what we actually have achieved. And we have this, uh, I mean, we are messengers of hope. As people of faith, we are messengers of hope. And that uh, takes becomes concrete in prayer and it becomes concrete in, in action as well. Uh, what we also bring is the perspective of eternity, to put it that way. Uh, I mean, so much in this, wor in this world depends on election periods of politicians or quarterly reports in the business world, but we bring the perspective of eternity. And I think the most basic questions and the, uh, well, the, the greatest challenges humanity is facing in these days actually require a perspective of eternity so that we can get away from having this surplus of fear that leads to so much evil and really have a surplus of hope instead. Uh, in what ways have the Muslim, uh, the religious Muslims in Italy uh, been, been active in working with refugees? I would say in two ways. First one, uh, first one was uh, to understand uh, the, the roots of this uh, situation of the migrants and refugees. They have unfortunately lost uh, the, their identity. They are looking for survival uh, and they have no knowledge and understanding of the West. So it's a interdisciplinary process. And on the other side, as it was mentioned, we need to have solutions that are practical, but also simple. Uh, so what we do the, what did in Italy was to liaise with uh, uh, Christian Catholic and Christian Protestant organizations, providing the interreligious uh, common uh, engagement trying to show them, even as you were mentioning in Hungary, the, uh, of course in Italy, pizza in, uh, <laughs> is, is easier. Uh, but uh, yes, during Ramadan, during the um, fasting month, breaking fast together with Christians, Catholics and Protestants, and showing how citizenship in the West has uh, a link with freedom of religion and with respect of pluralism. So it's, but through, through, through pizza, during the symbol of Ramadan, and praying before and after eating, each one according to his own identity. I think this provided some, some good example. Okay, thank you. I think what you illustrate is the global perspective that actually faith traditions bring. On the one hand, really a global outlook, but at the same time, a very local commitment and that's also what the world needs. Well, pizza is universal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. I think so. Okay. Now it's time for a new performance by our beloved artist, uh, Amina, and we're going to listen to an uh, Arabic song. Happy 
very much Amina and I know that you're accompanied by two fantastic musicians Jonas and Josef Sjöblom. Thank you very much. We're going to talk about crimes against the soul and I have two new guests Vanessa Barker, Swedish professor in sociology at the University of Stockholm. She has focused her recent research on the criminalization of refugees and migrants in Sweden and Europe. And we also have Ulrich Schmiedl, lecturer in theology politics and ethics at Edinburgh University. And he has of lately been focusing on Christian churches' role surrounding accommodation and integration of refugees in Europe and their societies. Uh, our societies have been sat under quite heavy pressure from big groups of immigration and politicians have been responding in a way that restricts private citizens from helping. And, and wh what's your re reaction? H how should we as human beings tackle that when we want to give help, we prohibit it? Uh, we should give help. Uh, I would say, first of all, that solidarity is not a crime. It's never a crime to help another human being. And the second point is that we as humans, social actors, I'm a sociologist, we make the world that we live in. We can never forget our human agency to change the world that we live in. And the third point is what we've already heard earlier today is the 
the small scale face to face uh, the human the human uh, the human embrace actually across in the, the forests in from the Poland and the Belarus border those are really moving stories of a human contact I would also say as someone who studies social movements and the history of social movements face to face one on one the meeting is absolutely vital but so is collective action and I think we're at a moment in time where a human chain standing up for other humans is absolutely necessary. You that are religiously faith-based, uh, can one really break the law in the name of humanity? Um, yes, one can. So I, I think theologically you have made two ways of reasoning about this. One, one's called civil disobedience is probably the, the, the more well-known approach. We say, okay, there are laws that are fundamentally unjust and therefore we have to disobey those laws. That's very much connected to Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, civil rights movement. They had a practice, a policy of civil disobedience. Um, but there's a less well-known tradition that is more connected to questions of migration. That's called civil initiative. Um, that term was coined by Jim Corbett, um, who worked in the US sanctuary movement. And there the idea is actually to say, no, we are not the ones breaking the law. The states are breaking the law. We are upholding the law of namely treating people like people, like treating human beings like human beings, like keeping our humanity. And so we are, we are keeping the law. It's not us breaking it. It's the states that break the law. And as religious communities, we uphold a higher law. You as an academic, <laughs> we've been listening to a lot of uh, practitioners. Uh, have you changed your ways of uh, how to interact and put into practice what you're expressing? Well, yeah, so, I mean, it has very much changed the way I understand what I do as an academic. Um, I think theologians, uh, speaking as a theologian, you know us as the guys who read big books and think thoughts at their desks, right? Um, and what I've come to realize working together with the World of Neighbors is in a way that the theology is not so much in the books, the theology is out there in the world and we need to follow it. And I think what the World of Neighbors does is, is really interesting in the sense that there's on the ground, grassroots thinking about how different religions can come together, acting for a common purpose. And actually, as theologians, academics, we're sort of hanging behind, we're lagging behind. And, and so I think there's incredibly much one can learn from the stuff that's going on on the ground. So it's less the academic teaching the practitioners, it's more the practitioners are teaching the academics. And then with a bit of luck, as academics, we can then help sort of um, support the work that's going on. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Vanessa, uh, you you will release a book called Crimes Against the Soul. It's it's a very good title. Uh, I can almost sense what it what it means. But uh, what questions do you want the readers to take out from from the book? Well, Crimes Against the Soul is something I've been working on when we see, as you said before, this kind of increased repression and coercion to stop migration. So when we see these kinds of practices, how can we communicate that this is a violation right, of, of human values, a violation of law? We study criminalization, we can see the impact. Uh, we start talking about violence doing unto people, still very little impact. And I've started to think of, we need to get into the space where we see the collective harm that's going on, the, the collective harm back on the society and the people. And this idea about crimes against the soul, this is these activities Right, break, of, of, of repression, of coercion. This is, it's soul crushing of our societies. And what happens to us who are already based in this society if we go against our nature of helping other people that are in need? What ramifications does it have to society? Well, I guess it's a really, it's a really tricky one. In a way, you'll, you'll have to think about who do you want to be as a human being? What does it mean to keep the common humanity? And in a way, I, I think the, the, the topic for this week is quite interesting, keeping humanity. There are people out there who have never been treated like human beings. So that's not about keeping humanity. It's about gaining your humanity in, in the first place. And we are connected in that. So if you don't, so the people who don't treat other people like human beings, they suffer from this as well. So it is not something where we can take ourselves out of the equation and saying this is happening to others. You know, in a way, this is what one of the practitioners um, repeated in many of the interviews we've done. Um, she said, if one human being suffers, then all of humanity suffers. If one human being is undocumented, then all of humanity is undocumented. There is no way out of that connection. And you agree? 
Well, I, I do agree. I, I think that the, the consequences are really serious. And we can see it's not only apathy, indifference, but it leads other people to commit more violence because it becomes seen as legitimate, that this is okay to leave uh, families uh, starving and freezing in the forest. Uh, if states are doing this and there's no pushback, there's no resistance, there's no collective action against that, it legitimizes that and it, it, it compounds. It's this... And it, it amputates our souls in a way. Yes, it's, it's crushing. It's crushing. Okay. Thank you very much for your knowledge and, and wisdom. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I mean, uh, it's wonderful to have you here. You have experiences that I don't share. I've never been a refugee. I was almost born in this country, and before that, we lived in England. What are your experiences that are that you would like me to know about? I would never like anyone to know about. <laughs> no. It's a a really hard thing to go through, and I don't wish anyone to go through it. But you were in a situation where it was actually a war situation. Am I right there? Yeah. Yeah. And did you lose family and friends? or? Yeah. Uh, so many uh, relatives and friends. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a horrible thing that we are doing to ourselves. And what has been your therapy? Is it the singing that has helped you to, to heal? Or do you still feel that you have a lot of wounds inside yourself? Uh, well, yeah, of course, music is um, my only weapon to fight against this. And um, But the wounds will always be there, but the music is helping a lot. And uh, that's because music is my weapon, so I'm, I will use it against that. And I will uh, try to make peace through music. Some people that are critical to refugees and migration, they will hold the point that people come to, to, to live off the system and stuff like that. But I guess that 99% of all the people want to live amongst the friends and the, the customs they're used to. Uh, what do you miss from your childhood and your upbringing? What's your loss? Mm. Well, everything. I can't really choose just one thing. Um, relatives, friends, and food, and the nature, it's different there. So, yeah, almost everything. Mm. I think you're doing a great job, especially since you've not been in, in Sweden so long. You bring us closer to the reality that you've been through, and uh, keep the good work up. Thank you. Thank I you for having me. Yeah, of course. You're, you're wonderful. Let me take you for a ride and we're going to go and look what practitioners do in other parts of Europe. You want to do that? Yeah, of course. Okay, <laughs> let's see. Je m'appelle Emmanuel Stein. J'habite à Paris, à Gambetta. J'ai 31 ans et j'ai fondé l'association Exilophone en 2018, il y a 3 ans. Aujourd'hui, l'association Exilophone organise des ateliers de musique toutes les semaines euh, au Cinq Toits, un centre d'hébergement pour réfugiés. Ces ateliers ont lieu tous les lundis à 15 h euh, depuis deux ans. Malgré la période du Covid, on a continué, même avec les masques. Et Baran est le leader de cet atelier, puisque c'est le coordinateur du projet, le musicien qui dirige ces ateliers. En général, ce n'est pas forcément des musiciens professionnels, mais euh, je me mets en fait au même niveau que tout le monde. Euh, je laisse euh, chacun s'exprimer à sa manière. Et peu importe euh, sa manière de s'exprimer, ben, on essaye de comprendre ce qu'il veut dire et de l'accompagner dans, dans cette démarche-là. Voilà. Donc parfois, en fait, on joue au percu. Donc il y a quelqu'un qui commence un rythme, d'Afghanistan par exemple. Bon, moi je ne suis pas afghan, mais on écoute et on essaie de se caler à lui. Parfois il y a quelqu'un qui veut chanter dans sa langue. Bon, on le laisse chanter, on essaie de l'accompagner, de faire des chœurs avec lui. Et donc c est, c est, en, en, en gros, ce n'est pas, en fait, euh, pas académique. Je ne suis pas en train d'enseigner quelque chose forcément. Je suis en train d'échanger avec, euh, avec, euh, avec pas mal de personnes. Voilà. 
ils se surprennent eux-mêmes. Et donc finalement, petit à petit, ils gagnent en confiance en eux aussi. Euh, et donc j'ai pu assister à plusieurs ateliers de baranes euh, et m'apercevoir que certains, certains des migrants qui étaient présents ne participaient pas beaucoup au départ. Et puis, euh, en revenant au fil des semaines, euh, ils étaient beaucoup plus actifs dans ces ateliers. Baran leur a donné aussi euh, des fonc une fonction dans la musique. Et donc, euh, ils avaient, voilà, comme, comme dans une pièce de théâtre, finalement, quand on a un rôle à jouer. Euh, et ça, c'est vraiment agréable. Moi, je, je viens d'une famille euh, juive, euh, juive euh, d'immigrés. Du côté de mon père, euh, c'était des juifs euh, d'origine de Pologne, Galicie. Euh, ils sont arrivés donc, dans des petits shtetls euh, où ils parlaient le yiddish. Ils sont arrivés en France, euh, dans la région de l'Est euh, parisien. Et, euh, et donc, c'est cette histoire d'immigration et d'intégration en France. Et donc, mon grand-père était euh, déporté à Auschwitz avec son père et son frère. C'est le seul survivant. Et, et en rentrant euh, d'Auschwitz, il a construit sa famille. Euh, et pour lui, sa famille, ses enfants, ses petits-enfants, c'était sa revanche sur Hitler. Et donc, euh, probablement, il y a des liens entre mon travail actuel et mon histoire familiale. Je n'ai pas forcément fait de lien tout de suite, mais là, petit à petit, avec le temps qui passe et avec euh, mon engagement, euh, je, je commence aussi à, à comprendre d'où ça vient. Et la question de l'exil est fondamentale. Il euh, n'y a pas le choix. Il faut aussi transformer la société. Et le regard que, que les gens ont sur, sur les migrants, ils, ils appellent ces gens-là seulement des migrants, mais ils ne sont jamais là à la rencontre vraiment de ces gens-là, à discuter avec eux, à comprendre leur histoire. Euh, et quand ils mettent un visage sur ces gens-là, tout change. Chaque personne dans, ce, dans ces ateliers-là euh, a forcément vécu des choses euh, horribles euh, dans sa vie. Hein. C'est des gens qui ont en général fait des, comme je le dis, des kilomètres, qui ont traversé pas mal de, de galères, de souffrances pour en arriver là. Et, mais une fois qu'on démarre, une fois que la musique commence à jouer, ben, on oublie tout ça en fait. C'est une manière aussi euh, de, de vider un petit peu euh, tous ces problèmes euh, qui nous euh, tracassent. Voilà. voilà. <rire> Donc mon rêve, ce serait euh, que cette association puisse euh, perdurer, qu'on puisse continuer euh, nos activités, continuer à payer les musiciens, et puis euh, peut-être un jour chanter aussi euh, avec euh, les musiciens euh, avec lesquels j'ai travaillé. Parce que maintenant que je viens d'enregistrer ma chanson, j'aimerais bien un jour pouvoir partager ces chansons-là aussi avec eux sur la scène. مرحبا أنا أملود الأمير صحفية بموقع أمل برلين الأخباري من أقدم أخبارنا اليومية باللغتين العربية والفارسية للقادمين الجدد والمهاجرين لحتى يكونوا جزء من المكان لازم يعرفوا شو عم بيصير فيه بالإضافة لتقاريرنا الثقافية والاجتماعية من أقدم تقارير سياسية اللي هي مثلا بالانتخابات الأخيرة حاولنا نلتقي بسياسيين وبرلمانيين من كافة الأحزاب لحتى يعطوا ويقدموا برنامجهم الانتخابي هذا بيسهل على خلينا نقول المواطنين الجدد من اختيار مرشحهم أو الحزب اللي هني بيتقاطع مع أفكارهم دي إيدي تو أمع بلين إز انشتانتن 2015 إم هابست Da saßen Conny, meine Schwester und ich am Esstisch und damals kamen ja sehr viele Menschen aus Syrien und aus Afghanistan nach Berlin und unter ihnen sehr viele Journalistinnen und Journalisten. Und auf der anderen Seite war damals klar, dass es sehr viele Menschen gibt, die neu nach Berlin kommen und die nicht wissen, was in der Stadt los ist. Ich bin Daoud Adil und ich komme aus Afghanistan. Seit ungefähr drei Jahren ich arbeite bei Amal Berlin als Videoredakteur. Es war eine gute Möglichkeit, weil es ist schwer, wenn man in ein fremdes Land kommt und wieder als Journalist zu arbeiten. عملي كصحفي بخليني حس حالي مثل الجسر ما بين الألمان من جهة واللاجئين والمهاجرين من جهة أخرى. 
بحاول خلص كل جهة من مخاوفة من الآخر بتوضيح وجهات النظر لكل جهة. Und was für mich besonders ist hier bei Amal ist dieser direkte Kontakt mit den Lesern und Leserinnen. Und ich denke, dieser Austausch mit der Leserschaft ist ein sehr, sehr wichtiger Punkt der Arbeit von Amal Berlin. Und wir sehen da drin auch ein Stück zu, ja, ein Diskussionsforum schaffen, ein Forum zu schaffen für demokratischen Austausch, wo man einfach mit anderen dann ins Gespräch kommen kann und auch über Themen diskutieren kann, die die Leute bewegen. كمان نحن بنقوم بتغطية الأحداث المهمة اللي بتصير بألمانيا وبتخص مثلا السوريين كمحاكمة كوبلينز اللي صارت ضد مجرمي الحرب السورية بنحاول نكون موضوعيين بنقل وجهات النظر المختلفة تجاه ما يجري Und wir sind stolz drauf, dass Amal Berlin und auch Amal Hamburg als zweite Redaktion immer größer wird بصفتي لاجئة من سوريا بركز كثير على القضايا اللي بتخص النساء العربيات والصعوبات اللي بيواجهوها ان كان عنف منزلي او تمييز وعنصرية بالشارع او بمكان العمل وربطهم مع الجهات المختصه لتقديم المساعده المهنيه لهم بحاول كثير غطي قصص نجاحهم لاظهار انه في نساء عربيات هن مثقفات هن قادرات على خوض غمار الحياه الجديده ومنهم هن بالقوالب اللي بيحاول الغرب يحطهم فيها انه المتخلفات من الضروري تقديم خطاب وروايه جديده مختلفه عما هو سائد بوسائل الاعلام وخاصه بما يتعلق بقضايا اللجوء والهجره بامل برلين نحن عم نحاول نقدم مساهمه صغيره بهذا النقاش اكيد الموضوع بياخذ وقت وبده استمراريه وما بيجي من يوم وليله بس نحن مستمرين بالعمل يعني Har du några så här, starka minnen av så här, något tillfälle som har betytt mycket för dig personligen inom ditt arbete? Då? Jag kommer alltid komma ihåg den gången jag... Jag tog emot en nyansökan om bostad och jag fick gå till sjukhuset för att möta den unga ensamkommande killen. Som... Det var kuratorn på sjukhuset som hade ringt mig. Han skulle förlora sitt boende genom Migrationsverket. Hon var desperat för att han var svårt sjuk i cancer. Och han var ensam och hade ingen familj och han var 19 år gammal. Och vem vände man sig till? När han inte har någon rätt till hjälp som asylsökande. Till kyrkan. Mm. Så att jag hade ingen aning om vad jag skulle möta och hur det skulle vara. Och, och han är i sjukhussängen. Han är svårt sjuk. Men den kraften som fanns i hans ögon. Det... Alltså den, den energin och den livsglädjen um, som, som liksom hela hans kropp var så otroligt svag och han var så otroligt sjuk. Men, men, men det som, den livsglädjen som strålade ut ur hans ögon är något av det största jag någonsin har sett. Um, så att från det besöket så var det jag som gick hem fylld med energi. Mm. Över att ha träffat en, en otroligt vacker människa. Mm. Så det, det kommer jag alltid bära med mig. Och det var två och ett halvt år sedan. Nu har hans prover varit bra under ett års tid. Och här om veckan så satt vi tillsammans och skickade in en ansökan för honom till UNHCRs Refugee Speakers Program. Som jag blev tipsad om genom A World of Neighbors. Så nu håller vi tummarna för att han efter årsskiftet ska få ett positivt besked. Så att han får möjlighet att berätta sin historia.
What can one do? The question is, what can the everyday person do? Because the question about helping can be so overwhelming. Uh, do you have some kind of, a, not quick fix, but some puzzles? Yeah, I think some puzzle, one puzzle, p piece of puzzle is to, to connect care for others and self-care. Because the two of them belong together. They are not opposites. Explain. Because... Yeah, well, self-care without care for others leads into emptiness. But care for others without self-care leads to burnout. And, and here I have a Jewish saying, and to get it right, I put it down here. I, I think it's, 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 it's lovely. Do not be daunted by the enormity of the world's grief. Do justly now. Love mercy now. Walk humbly now. You're not obliged to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. And I think that's a comment on a word from the prophet of Micah, uh, chapter 6, verse 8. So I guess in everyday language, no one can do everything, but we can all take part in what in the Jewish tradition is called the tikkun olam, the mending of the world. And I think in this we should be faithful and happy about the gifts that each of us can bring and they are different gifts. I sometimes envy the practitioners who really do the hands-on work and see the change. I can't feel a holy envy but at the same time I also cherish the gift that is entrusted to me as the, uh, as the ministry of word and sacrament. So we all need each other in this and that's 
that's the beauty. That's the beauty. When did you get the awakening that you come to light by helping other people and that you develop yourself as a spirit? And of course, for you also in your faith, but was this an early experience? Well, in it life? is my faith. And I think it was an experience of growth. And also I have, I've never been a refugee, but I'm still considered a migrant and I have lived in four different countries throughout my life. And I think that has taught me something about feeling as a stranger and cherishing the community and the communion that builds up by meeting people face to face, meeting the eyes and not least the, the Christian community. That's One of the reasons for this initiative, as I understand it, is to encourage also those who are actively working today, the practitioners. Uh, do you have anything you would like to address to them? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, we, we all need encouragement, especially in these times. Uh, and I think, well, something that I would say today is trust in the love of God and in the ripple effect. And uh, you look a little puzzled about no, the I'm ripple not, effect. No, I, actually, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> uh, but I, I looked it up. The ripple effect occurs when an initial disturbance to a system propagates outward to disturb an increasingly larger portion of the system, like ripples expanding across the water when an object is dropped into it. Now, I think that a disturbance of an inhumane system actually is the work of the Holy Spirit. And if we do that work of disturbing uh, inhumane systems and trusting the ripple effect, we are doing the work of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, my experience is that we reflect. Uh, people that are happy usually meet happy people. People that are generous meet a more generous world. And people that are angry meet a more mad world. So sometimes people are complaining about their lives and sometimes the change starts also within what you project. Of course, there's something to it. Uh, it doesn't fix all the problems, but there is strength in, in it. Your staff has done a magnificent work. I've been working with yes. them for uh, some time here, and they have collected different uh, people who are actually working that are refugees themselves, helping refugees, and maybe you know what I'm aiming at. Uh, well, that's what happens all the time. Yeah, and that is Wave of Hope. Of course. Of course. And, Wave uh, of <laughs> and we're going to look at a report that is called Wave of Hope. And this is uh, very interesting and inspiring. زمین ما خسته خسته از جفای سرزمین من به سرود و به صدای سرزمین من درد مند و به دوای سرزمین من سلام is a school like uh, full of peace for me because uh, there are many kind people because the refugees were working there it seems that ourselves help to ourselves it's uh, something that we can show our talent and also we can uh, learn something from others and we can teach the other people for me it's like a lighthouse in a darkness uh, the, uh, the children could learn many things from the teachers and, um, and this organization has helped a lot for the people. They, done, have or has, had, had, fall. We started from nothing and uh, we really want to keep it uh, the way that it is. We really want to keep it as a refugee-based uh, uh, you know, action because it was founded by a refugee. We are trying to find the talents uh, among the refugee community because we live all together and we uh, know each other better. 
we know about the challenges that a refugee can you know, face every day, and we are trying to schedule our program according to that. You know, Wave of Hope has made a very safe space for the um, students and the teachers to express themselves. Uh, Wave of Hope for me is like uh, life changing and uh, we are providing uh, non-formal education like who are not able to get proper education from the government so we are giving some education to these people. The first thing I want to do when I get up is get dressed and just go to the gallery, paint, be here, help. This is chance also for me as a person that um, is Greek to get to know these people, connect with these people and uh, start communicating with them. Uh, so that I can say that changed my life because I learned many things and I changed myself. Uh, Wave of Hope is a world of support and empowerment from refugees to refugees. And I would like to welcome Zekiriya Farisad, who is an Afghan practitioner and also refugee, now residing in Switzerland and hoping to reconnect with his family, which is his wife and five children. Uh, Zekiriya, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I want to tell my uh, hello to everyone here. And uh, it's a pleasure that uh, I'm with you guys. You started in the camp of Moira, which had about 20,000 refugees. Uh, could you give us a background uh, about this initiative, Wave of Hope, and how it grew? Mm. Uh, actually, um, uh, I left uh, my, my beloved homeland in March 2018 with my wife and my five children, and the journey was extremely extremely tough and especially for my children uh, with lots of problems and difficulties on the way that we came. And after a very tough uh, journey by a dinghy boat, we arrived in, the, uh, in Lesbos. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we lost a 10 years old girl in our dinghy boat. Uh, and after that, when we arrived in Moria refugee camp, uh, it was, uh, uh, I was uh, in shock, uh, and after that, that I, I thought that Europe is uh, something I, 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 I couldn't imagine, imagine like that, that uh, I saw Moria, and uh, unfortunately we didn't have any other choice, and we, we must uh, live there. And uh, as a journalist and as a activist for justice in Afghanistan and, and as an educated person, when uh, I wanted to register or enroll my children in a school, there weren't any public school for refugees in around Maria refugee camp or Maitilini city. Uh, there were some organizations that they have some small spaces for schools that uh, some people can enroll their children. When I asked them to register my children, they said that uh, you have to wait six to one year because there is no space and there are lots of uh, students that they are, uh, there is a long waiting list for uh, my children. And uh, suddenly after that, I started uh, in 
I can't see that uh, when I can do something for for my children and for others, uh, I will. Uh, I I did start it. Uh, fortunately, uh, this, the the other days I went to the bazaar and I bought a whiteboard with some markers and I started uh, a new class under an olive tree, and this was the. The first class of wave of hope for the future. Excuse me for interrupting you, uh, but but what you say basically, there was no education for the uh, children and the youths in the camp, and you took the initiative and you started to hold in classes under this olive tree. But now the wave of hope has become a, a, a very big and partly successful organization. How how would you quantify it? How many? Uh, pupils in different ca camps are involved in, in uh, or enrolled in Wave of Hope. As you said, uh, it it was a small initiative, and after that uh, first class, uh, fortunately, I received lots of interest from the refugee communities in the camp, and they they asked me to to have more classes, and after that. Uh, uh, I started to find that um, uh, find and make a team of uh, um, people from different communities of refugees in the camp that we must have a school here uh, inside the camp. And fortunately, we 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 succeed and we we succeeded and we uh, we did uh, this. Uh, Zach Zachariah. To, Zachariah. To Sorry. Uh, I, I would just like to to quantify how big is the organization today. Yeah, right now we have uh, more than uh, two uh, two thousand five hundred students. Uh, we have uh, four schools. Uh, we have uh, one um, uh, art laboratory in Italy, Italy City. And uh, uh, as I as I as you know, we built a school in Afghanistan. We and we had a. Uh, office and uh, a school in Afghanistan as well, but unfortunately, after the collapse of the uh, previous government of Afghanistan, uh, we finished our activities in uh, Afghanistan. And for now, we have more than 2,500 students. Uh, we have different uh, activities like uh, our schools, uh, WGF uh, Sports, WHF Art Laboratory, WGF Football Clubs, WGF uh, activities, WGF, yes. Yes, uh, 2,500 and still counting. Uh, I know that you made a great change and built mental uh, resilience uh, for a lot of young people. Our wish from here is that you're going to continue doing your work and, of course, more important than so, reunite with your family. And I know that you've been waiting for them so long. And you told me when we spoke the other week that they're most likely coming to you within a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Fortunately, fortunately, this year was a good year for me, 2022. Because uh, I have my uh, family from Afghanistan, my mom and my brothers, uh, my nephew in Italy, uh, and also um, as soon as possible, uh, after 10 days, I will have my family with my, with, with myself here uh, in Switzerland. And uh, yeah, this is all the prayers yeah. of the people and the, the things that we did uh, for the for a very, uh, uh, in a very bad condition for the very needy yeah. people. Zach Zachary, yeah. It is their prayers, and now we will. Yeah, uh, excuse me for interrupting you. Uh, Thank you very much for your participation and thank you for doing what you do for other refugees. You set a perfect example. We'll be hearing from you again. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Frank. Thanks. Yeah. Anna Jelm, Programme Director, Church of Sweden. This has been a very hectic and busy week for you, uh, having these uh, different practitioners' sessions. Tell us about it. 
it has been really a busy week. Um, over the last couple of days, we have actually had more than 60 seminars arranged by, I think, 160 people who actually got involved in arranging these seminars. And when we counted yesterday, more than 1,000 people have attended and been a part of the conversations over the last couple of days. That is crazy numbers. Yes, it is. How long have you been preparing this? Well, since I can remember. <laughs> No, really, it really builds on the practitioners and on the work that is done everywhere and that we work so hard now to make visible and to share with others. And I'm thinking that we uh, shall take a little uh, sneak view on what has been done and it's a fantastic work that has been done by the practitioners. Uh, did, you, did you want to add something before? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, so what we are going to see now is from one of the practitioners' sessions. So the mornings have been the sessions with the practitioners' network, and they've been working into three groups, and we will hear from one of the groups. And they have been working really hard, inspired by our former colleague, who unfortunately passed away before Christmas, Dirk Ficke. But they carry on his legacy, and they will share with us what they have been up to during this week. So that has been the morning sessions, and the afternoon sessions has been open for all and involved much many more people. Let's look at it. Thank you. Thank you. So, tell us who you are. I'm Rikke Vorberg from Amsterdam, theologian, sometimes an activist. Um, sometimes artist, uh, if needed, and I'm uh, participating in organizing the uh, practitioners' meetups in December and now here in uh, the Week of Neighbors. And now, in the mornings of the Week of Neighbors, you have been meeting in sessions. Uh, we, we organized in three groups, indeed. From from um, uh, one was about organization, because we realized we have to get organized um, uh, ourselves. What was the feeling today when you had your last meeting? It's been a, a, a special feeling because some of us have um, laid uh, awake all night in, in, in desperation about what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, we got a voice message of, of one of our practitioners saying, I cannot be there, but pray for me and please gather because we will need you all here in Poland uh, when new uh, uh, refugees will come from Ukraine and there will be many. Uh, so that was the first thing, lighting a candle, having a prayer uh, and connecting about the need. Um, then there was uh, the feeling of um, gratefulness that the spirit uh, in which this thing uh, all has started, that Dirk, who is not with us anymore, is still so much present uh, in, his, in his way of trusting us. Um, when, uh, when we would ask, why are we here? Yeah, it's, we are here because Dirk asked us and he trusted us that we would be of use. And then everybody, we realized that um, Dirk would say, no, you're here because of you. And there's the eagerness, that's the first part, um, to develop, to take our role, to be involved in a way we can, of course, because I mean, there's, everybody's so busy. But to be able to be involved in your own terms, that desire is, is um, uh, present in all the practitioners. So what is your message to those who are watching the live this afternoon? Our message would be, please... Uh, join us, please be part of it, for we need you all. So let's please join our hands and we will not ever form an organization that is like hierarchical, structured in boxes. We will be open and morpheus. But if you can handle that, then, then, we, then we need you uh, to respond on the emergencies and to build the future of a Europe that we hope for. The way ahead, looking ahead. And I would uh, reach out to you, uh, Imam Yahya. What mindset is required for us to, to, to keep on building a society that is sustainable and it is accepting and respecting? Because it's not going to be smooth sailing, I guess. It's going to be bumps and turns. Yes, it's a long process. So we need patience, but we need uh, concrete uh, action. And uh, I think the... The two key words, uh, keeping humanity on one side and the neighborhood that were chosen by Archbishop uh, Jacqueline are very important. Uh, I would dare add that uh, due to also what happened now in Ukraine, uh, uh, we have to be aware of what is not uh, humanity. 
which is brutality. If, uh, and on the other side, uh, in order to keep humanity and discover the richness and the added value of uh, neighborhood, probably as religious leaders inspire sacredness, inspire the, the true value of uh, holiness as an added dimension in life. Uh, and this, this might be an inspiration of, for everybody, believer and non-believer, in his concrete responsibilities in this challenging and troubled world. Anna told us that there were a thousand participants. That's a lot. And, and uh, looking ahead, what are your hopes and visions of a world of neighbors uh, and its future? Uh, well, first of all, I feel an immense gratitude today. I'm so thrilled, I'm amazed, I'm humbled by what has been done. And also, I, I trust even more now in the structure of networking. When we started, we said, oh, we're not going to, we are not used to doing something in network structures. When the Church of Sweden does something, the Church of Sweden <laughs> owns it in a sense. Uh, but having this network structure was actually successful. And I think it will be even more in the future because it is needed. Uh, and I trust in the ripple effect because I see in it the, the holy work of the Holy Spirit. And for you, Imam Yaya, uh, what send of message would you like to convey to the practitioners and all the people that watches this uh, broadcast? Well, to, to really uh, make uh, the hope on concrete uh, action uh, prevail on desperation. Because, uh, because uh, I, I can understand citizens and believers uh, losing hope uh, and losing trust uh, in, in leaders, religious leaders even, political and financial leaders even, maybe more. But we, sh we sh sh have to react to this desperation with more hope and more consistency in a honest work together in brotherhood and sisterhood. This is, there is no other solution, but of course we have to also help facilitate, if I may say, the changement of the mindset, where added universal values are implemented uh, within the, the, um, the management of uh, all policies. I know that when you came today, you decided, and I guess that it was even more reinforced by the happenings within the, with uh, Ukraine and Russia, to have a mutual prayer. Yes, let us pray. God of life and peace, we pray for the people of Ukraine, for all who have the power to stop war and destruction. For victims and refugees and all those who are able to help, for Europe that is our home, God, for generation after generation, you have been our refuge in conflict, crisis, and disasters. Have mercy on your world. Show us the path of life and give us the will to walk it. Amen. Amen. Thank uh, Anna? How can uh, how how do we move on and and uh, ahead together? Well, uh, a world of neighbors has just handed in a really large uh, interreligious uh, EU application for a continuation of the work, hopefully. But that's maybe the least important part. The most important part, I think, are the, all the connections that are made through this week, but also through the last couple of years. And what Rico pointed out in this last episode, that do come and join us. Do join the ripple effect and let's build a, a society that is based on humanity together. And uh, Ancha, I know that you have... Uh, uh, Sort of some blessings, <laughs> and we're going to listen to Amina in a little while. But I think we're going to let you have the last said word. Well, thank you, thank you very much. So may the God of peace be with us. May the God of justice enfold us. May the God of love surround us. And may God's 
everlasting light. Show us the way. Amen. Sometimes I lay under the moon And I thank God I'm breathing Then I pray don't take me soon Cause I am here for a reason Sometimes in my tears I drown But I never let them get me down So when negativity surrounds I know Children will play